So we are, we are kind of late, even 15 minutes late for the start of the session. Uh, good morning to everyone. Very, thank you very much for coming. You are very welcome. I have to thank also Maite Costa for inviting me, for inviting me to, to chair this session. I have to say, I mean, as I, she said, I come in from Bank of Spain, Bank of España, and it's a central bank. Um, but even though we are very interested uh, in these topics, uh, especially climate change and energy transition because of the important implications, economic implications it has. And we are kind of new in this topic, kind of new, I mean, some years already, but very new in comparison with pol monetary policy, for instance. But we are making big efforts to learn in this, in this area. So thank you very much for inviting me. And I, I hope to see you, some of you, giving a seminar in the Bank of Spain someday. Eh? Today, this session, my session is called uh, Sustainable Finance. As, matter, as uh, Maite has pointed out before, uh, uh, energy transition mean, needs huge amounts of investment. Uh, for instance, the European Commission estimates that uh, there is a need of an uh, annual investment of 350 billion additional in additional investment to the overage of the last decade. So it's a huge amount of money and this, and this has to be financed uh, not only for, for, for the public side but also from the private side. And these investments need to be financed and they need also to be efficient in order to get the goal. And these are the topics that um, this session is going to deal with. Uh, we have very good four papers. The first one is uh, entitled Why do firms issue green bonds? And it's going to be presented by Julian Dovans. Uh, in this paper, uh, what, uh, they test the hypothesis that uh, managers issue green bonds uh, in order to signal uh, their efficiency, I mean their corporation efficiency, to get uh, energy transition. And in that way, they get a positive effect on the stock price and then on their bonus, I guess. Uh, uh, the second paper, uh, uh, I, uh, did I say that it was going to be uh, presented by Julian Dovan? Uh, the second paper is Dynamic Misallocation of Investment in Solar Energy. And uh, here, uh, uh, is going to be presented by Nicolas Hayden of the Paris School of Economics. And uh, let me, I here I have a little uh, resume of the, of the paper. Uh, the second paper uh, is develops a methodology to quantify the misallocation of investments uh, in solar energy by comparing the present value of uh, the cost of realized investment with a, contract, a contrafactual optimal trajectory. So here the important thing for the, is to see the misallocation is time instead of where, is when, no? As other papers focus more on when or on where, and this paper focus on when. And I'm not going to spoil your results because are very amazing, and I don't want to be a spoiler. The third paper uh, is going to be presented by, uh, let's see, by, um, by Rocío Ramón Collada from Universidad de Sevilla, and uh, here uh, the it's called Green Innovation and Energy Efficiency, Moderating Effect of Institutional Quality based on the threshold model. What they do here eh, is to see if the institutional quality eh, poses a threshold in the positive relation between innovation and energy efficiency, the, eh, in the sense of reduction the, the, the carbon emissions. And the fourth paper is is going to be presented by uh, Cristina, Cristina Pizarro, the eh, Universidad de, del País Vasco. And in this, uh, they built a model here uh, using uh, option theory. And what they see here, I mean, what they study here, is uh, the, the reduction, the risk reduction eh, uh, possessed by different 
uh, different uh, um, renewable energy subsidies. I mean, especially the, the most common ones that are the one that, uh, that uh, guarantees for the uh, producer the price and the other one that guarantees the income. Eh? And uh, they built a model, as I said, based on, on option theory. And I don't want to take more time. Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, for the summary. Um, thank you for thank you for having me. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the symposium on a, on a, on a very uh, hot topic of uh, how to finance the, the energy uh, transition. Um, this is a, this is going to be about the green bonds, and it, which is probably the most emblematic instrument to channel investment uh, towards uh, green projects. It's, it's not very easy to talk about green bonds and sustainable finance in front of economists because. You know, economists believe that, well, we have carbon pricing. So, I mean, if, you, if we implement carbon pricing at, a, at an adequate level in a uniform way, we don't have to, to, uh, to worry about investment. Investment to green projects is going to follow. You don't need a taxonomy after all. You don't need to define what's green, what's not. That's wonderful. But, um, you know, economists are probably often right, but they are not uh, very good lobbyists. So, unfortunately, uh, we are where we are, and, um, and we are far from the, the dream of a uniform, adequate uh, level of carbon pricing. And as a matter of fact, governments and financial institutions, even central banks, are very excited about uh, other instruments like uh, green bonds. So sometimes we have to uh, get our hands dirty and uh, look at things uh, economists don't really, uh, are not really fan about to, to, uh, to assess uh, whether and, and how these new instruments work. So that's what we, we, we try to do with my colleagues in this paper. So basically, green bonds are just like uh, bonds, but they earmark the proceeds of the bond to uh, green, typically climate-friendly projects, typically CO2-reducing uh, projects. And, and for example, um, Unilever, a, a while ago, uh, in 2014, issued a famous green bond that was used to finance new green so CO2 redu reducing production capacities. So production capacities to produce so new factories, for example, to produce new uh, green detergents or new kinds of uh, fridges, uh, less energy intensive. And when Unilever announced that certified green bonds, uh, it, it, this was welcomed by investors very enthusiastically. And this translated into stock returns of about 5% around the announcement of the, of the green bond. And just like Unilever, many companies um, uh, issued a green bond to finance their green initiatives. And this translated into a green bond boom. Oh, sorry. So I can't. Oh, sorry. I, I should have maybe. Uh, okay, does it work? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry for that. Yes, okay. And you see that, you know, in the second graph, you see that uh, just like Unilever and other companies, a very rapidly increasing number of companies issued green bonds to finance CO2 reducing projects, and this has been called the green bond boom. So what are uh, these, uh, these instruments more, maybe for formally speaking? They are uh, earmarking instruments. There is no question about risk because, if you like, there is no... Uh, so green bonds are not more or less risky than conventional bonds because both kinds of bonds are backed by the entire balance sheet of, of the firm, so there is no uh, risk difference. Uh, green bonds are voluntary instruments, and on top of that, they do not require any uh, additionality. So economists are very skeptical about, uh, about the, the potential of these instruments, to generate additional incentives. Why would firms constrain themselves to do something that they would not like to, to do otherwise? Okay, so that's basically the, the question. But however, green bonds are something special that there is a dimension of a promise. So you certify that you're going to uh, report about the financing of the projects to investors. So you make a promise to, to investors. And also, uh, we can be very skeptical about the effectiveness of these instruments. The empirical literature on the green bond boom shows that, as a matter of fact, uh, these green bonds are environmentally effective, so typically lead to CO2 reductions at the firm level. 
So what do we know about green bonds and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and about why firms uh, issue uh, green bonds? Well, uh, not much, but, but not nothing. At least we know that shareholders benefit a lot from green bonds. And more precisely, on the day when green bonds are announced by issuers, the stock price of issuers rise by abnormal returns. That are uh, relatively significant here. So, you know, estimates vary between 0.5 and 1.5%. These, these are uh, significant uh, abnormal returns. By abnormal returns, I mean returns that cannot be explained by traditional uh, market factors. So, this is probably the most uh, important styled facts about uh, green bonds. So, there may be reasons why green projects perform better than uh, conventional projects. For example, even though even though uh, carbon pricing is, uh, is not adequate, as a matter of fact, there exist public policies that penalize the CO2 emissions. And so that, advantage, that advantages uh, green projects that reduce CO2 emissions. So that's one thing. Another thing is investors' concern. And for example, in a, in a recent but, but already very influential paper, Pastor, Stambo, and, uh, and Taylor document a green bond premium uh, that is reducing the cost of capital for green bond issuers, slightly so, and green stock returns. These effects are limited, however. And on top of that, stock returns and the date when green bonds are announced show that markets learn something on the day when these green bonds are announced. So this is what we look at in this, in this research. Okay, we, we, uh, we consider that, you know, that there may be some concerned investors ready to sacrifice their rate of return uh, there may also be some limited public policies, but there is also an informational role of green bonds. Green bonds announcement, when Unilever basically announced that it commits to finance these new factories for green products, market learned something about the future profitability of this uh, investment. So that is what we, what we look at in that paper, and more precisely, what we do is to build a signaling model of green bond issuance in which green bonds issuance uh, signals something about the profitability of the finance projects and that translates into stock returns. And moreover, we add an, an additional ingredient that is that managers care about these stock returns. So why do managers care about stock returns? Potentially for many reasons, but at least because uh, they are sometimes often paid with stock components like stock options, and so they directly benefit from uh, stock returns. You know? <laughs> so that is what we, uh, that is the second ingredient of our, of our theory, and we show that when you model this uh, signaling role of green bonds and this interest of managers for stock returns, well, you obtain an amplifying, an amplifying mechanism that is that green bonds amplify pre-existing incentives to decarbonize, including uh, public policies. So we know basically the story is that we, we do not observe uh, signals uh, in, this, in this industry or, or very imperfectly, but we also observe how much people care about the signal, how much people care about the stock return that is reflected, that reflects the signal. So that offers us one way, well, a simple way to test the signaling role of uh, green bonds. So I'm sorry for the next uh, three, slides, three slides that are going to be a bit technical, but I'm, I'm going to try to, to make sense of it in an easy way. So in the baseline model of our paper, uh, things are pretty simple. There is a continuum of firms, you know, uh, so in, an industry, and, uh, and two dates. And firms have regular activities that are given, fixed, but each firm in the industry has an incremental project. At date zero, these incremental projects all require the mobilization of one unit of capital. And at the same time, managers have to decide whether they make these projects green or not. If they adopt a green technology to implement their projects or not. Then at date one, these projects... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> okay, and there's a bit of a lag, so it's a bit confusing. All right. Okay. So at day zero, uh, managers need to mobilize one unit of capital and decide whether these projects are going to be green or not. And at day one, these projects uh, uh, are operated, you know, so they generate emissions. Less emissions when these projects are green than when they are conventional. Uh, and they also generate benefits. And benefits 
generated by this project depends on the type of their projects. So all projects are different. So let me uh, explain in detail what's going on here. So if the project is made in a conventional way, we assume that, oops, oops. So Imar was uh, apparently much better at uh, de dealing with the, so in, where is the computer? Oh, that this one over there? Okay, okay, I see. All right, okay, here we are. So if the project is implemented in a conventional way, it generates benefits, VB, that are fixed and known. It's like business as usual benefits, right? However, when the same project is, is uh, implemented using a green technology, its benefits is maybe reduced by delta V, in that case we, we have an additional cost, or if delta V is negative, it generates additional benefits, I'm agnostic about that, but its benefit is uh, different by minus delta V here. That depends on I, the type of the project. So some projects are better than others when they are made in a green way. And moreover, we assume that delta V here is not directly observable by investors. Unlike business as usual technologies, green technologies are new and are more uh, difficult to judge by investors. Okay, and on top of that, we assume that there is, a, you know, maybe a carbon penalty in the background that is going to be denoted by tau, and uh, all projects are financed by bonds, and green projects are financed by certified green bonds. So perfectly certifying to investors that these projects are green. We assume, moreover, that green bonds may be cheaper than uh, conventional bonds by, by a term theta uh, uh, here, where theta is a warm glow uh, parameter for bond investors. So to sum up, the project, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, an incremental project generates profits that consist of the, the benefit of the project minus the cost of repaying the bond, that may depend on the technology if investors are concerned, minus the, the cost of uh, CO2 emissions plus some noise, whatever, and we assume that managers care about that. You know, this is the objective of managers here, and they care about the expected projects, thank you, the expected uh, benefits generated by these projects. Uh, but they also care about SK here, which is the stock price of their firm. And alpha here is a very important parameter. Alpha is a parameter that captures how much managers are interested in the stock price of their firm. Okay? Maybe because they are paid with uh, stock options. So what we have in mind is that, is that um, at the, when green projects are certified, stock markets learn something and uh, adjust their valuation of firms and projects according to the green finance certification. So I, I think I can uh, summarize the resolution of this model with two basic equations. The first one is about uh, the green bond supply. So it tells that all projects with a type I that is lower, that is good enough, if you like, lower than IE, uh, will be implemented in a green way and certified by green bonds. And the cutoff uh, project, IE, is such that from the perspective of the manager, the impact of the green projects on profits is balanced by the manager's benefit from stock returns generated by the green project. This is an increasing relation between stock returns, delta S, and IE, the proportion of green bonds, because when managers expect a higher stock returns, they want to do more uh, green bonds. And the second equation is stock market reaction. Stock market reaction depends on the proportion of green bonds. So I won't go into the details, and, and, we, and we, 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 there, are, there are parameters that maybe I need to speed up a bit, so I'm sorry to, not to explain uh, the, the, the meaning of the parameters. Uh, basically, investors may be concerned or not. Um, the, the bottom line is that uh, st uh, the, the, the reaction of stock investors correspond to the signaled net benefit. And investors are rational. They understand that if, if a project is green and certified by green bonds, that means that the, that the project is relatively good. So they estimate the benefit of the project, you know, rationally anticipating that managers have a relatively good project. And this is a decreasing relationship because between uh, I, the proportion of green bond, and delta S, because as there are more green bonds, 
uh, marginally, they are worse. And so there is a sort of dilution effect, sort of decreasing returns. So in the end, the equilibrium in this industry is at the intersection of these two relations, that is uh, this, this point here, right here. And uh, again, I won't go into the detail, it's pretty simple. Stock returns motivate managers to do more green bonds, to do more green projects than I0 here, which is the proportion of green projects that they would have implemented in absence of green finance certification, in absence of uh, green bonds. And you can play with these curves to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to obtain the effects of alpha and tau, and the bottom line is that they depend on each other. Managers do more green bonds when they are more interested in stock returns generated by green bonds, and this is complementary with uh, uh, carbon penalties. So uh, this looks complicated, but in fact it's very simple. This term here is I0, the proportion of green bonds, of green projects that man managers would implement in absence of green bonds, and this formula shows that it is amplified by alpha. And this has a very important implication, that means that carbon penalties and green bonds are complementary instruments. This formula shows that if carbon penalties were low, well, carbon uh, 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 green bonds would amplify uh, not much, if you like. So they are complementary. So we use data on green bonds and uh, firms' characteristics and carbon penalties to test this prediction. That is basically a, a one way to test the signaling role of green bonds. Uh, and we, have a, we use a proxy for managers' interest in the stock price that is called the WPS. That is how much the, the pay of a CEO depends on the stock price. So it's very close to what we want to model with uh, alpha in the model. And you see here that at the sector level, um, we, we do it with industries and we have many industries, but so for, this, is, uh, this is clearer graphically with, uh, at the sector level. At the sector level, you see that sectors in which managers are more interested in the stock price of their firm are also sectors that issue more green bonds. Um, it was probably for me. Was it for me? I'm, I'm done in one minute. Thank you. <laughs> so, but you know, what, what our theory says, what our theory tells is more than that. It tells that behind this positive relation, this positive relation is actually driven by a carbon penalties. So that is what we test by uh, relying on the, the prediction of our model that the effect of the carbon price and of managers' interest is complementary. And we find something that is, and I won't go, won't go into the details of the regression results, but we find something that is very uh, much in line with the theory. So, uh, to conclude, um, I would say that, so, although green bonds are voluntary instruments, it is not enough to disqualify green bonds as an effective instrument. In fact, uh, our results suggest that green bonds are complementary with carbon penalties, and when carbon penalties are sufficiently uh, high, well, green bonds do induce managers to do more green projects than they would do if the carbon price was uh, low. No? Uh, on, the, on the other hand, that means that governments cannot hope to avoid carbon pricing, okay? With no carbon pricing, uh, low carbon penalties cannot be compensated with green bonds. Green bonds may only work if we have already uh, sufficiently high carbon penalties in the first place. So thank you so much, sorry for, for, the, for the time. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Okay, go ahead. Just one, no? Ah, okay. After, after, at the end, all of them. Okay. Good morning to all. Um, first, I'm uh, very glad to be here to present um, my paper 
written with Nicolas Astier from uh, the PSC. Uh, this paper is entitled Dynamic Misallocation of Investments in Solar Energy. The idea of this paper is to measure, um, to study the cost efficiency of past investments in uh, the French solar park. And uh, we think that focusing on uh, the French case is uh, quite interesting since France has decided to first focus on small distributed units for solar instead of uh, large utility scale units that would benefit from um, economies of scale. So we try to look at the, yeah, how inefficient what was um, that decision. So why cost efficiency uh, is important? So as you may know, um, sorry, as you may know, Europe has issued the WePower plan um, after uh, recent events uh, in Ukraine aiming at accelerating clean energy. So it has put um, more stringent targets on uh, the share of renewable energy in the electricity consumption. And we basically want to, um, oh, it's not working, but sorry. Sorry for that. Um, there is a lag. Anyway, we want to go from 22% and reach 45% um, of uh, renewables in the uh, electricity consumption in 2030. So this is very stringent. And in that context, cost efficiency is uh, an important lever to accelerate the transition. Um, OK, so we focus on the case of France, and we think it's interesting because when we look at the past, uh, we see that we have a smaller installa installation, solar installation, that got cons consistently highest subsidies in the market. And this has significant impact on the, the, the trajectory, the mix of uh, project types that are implemented. So as you see on this graph, you see that the smallest uh, project types, the residential rooftop uh, PV, are implemented. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Are uh, were uh, commissioned first, and then we uh, built utility scale, larger uh, facilities. Okay. So we made that decision, knowing, however, that um, smallest units are were consistently more expensive uh, per unit of energy than largest utility scale uh, facilities. Okay? So this raises some questions. We want to know if we can rationalize this choice on efficiency grounds. Um, maybe stating that smallest installations have uh, highest, generate highest social value as compared to utility scale units. Um, but if we cannot find an efficiency rationale, we want to compute, to estimate the opportunity cost of having such trajectory. Knowing that this choice might not be only based on efficiency, and maybe there were other policy, uh, political goals that were aimed, such as uh, to spur um, local economic uh, like local jobs or to direct revenues to households, other objectives that are not covered by this paper. Um, yeah, okay. So, however, what we see in the French context is that we have a weak rationale to choose um, distributed over utility scale units, okay? First, um, we have recent studies that show that smallest units that are connected to the distribution grid do not um, generate significant grid savings. They do not differ grid expansions and investments. Um, so no benefit on that, uh, on, that tie, on that side, sorry. And also we know from the French electricity grid um, that in France, 
we have like a uniform social value generated by so uh, solar units, okay? Social value being like, you know, we compute social value by looking at so uh, power plants that are displaced by an additional um, uh, solar unit, okay, put on the grid. And this power plant that is displaced um, is linked to environmental costs and fuel costs that are um, avoided by the additional solar units. However, in France, this is quite uniform across the territory because we have a unique transmission grid with very little congestion. So if you put a solar unit in the north or in the south, you're likely to displace the same power plant, so to have the same economic benefits at the end, okay? So knowing that, we focus on um, the distortions, the inefficiency induced by these asymmetric subsidies that I showed uh, just before. And uh, yeah, we try to measure the, um, this misallocation that happened. Um, and doing so, we, um, we uh, divert from current studies, like last studies, sorry, from the literature focusing on uh, misallocating solar plants, uh, because these studies focus on where solar facilities uh, should have been built to maximize social value. So they look, at, they look at inefficiencies regarding the location, okay? Knowing that in other contexts, such as the US or Germany, um, social value is very heterogeneous according to the location because you have different transmission grids or you have a lot of congestions uh, between uh, sub-areas. So you don't displace the same plant. So in that context, it's relevant. For instance, um, Sexton et al. Um, does that for the US, and Lemp et al. does that for Germany, okay? Um, so we do not focus on where solar facilities uh, should be allocated, but we focus on when solar facilities should have been commissioned, okay? And doing so, we look at inefficiencies regarding the levelized cost of electricity, uh, leveraging on um, heterogeneous investment costs that varied in time and across project types. Okay. Yeah. So what we do is in, in this paper, we obtain, a, we argue that, um, yeah, an arguably lower bound for the cost of misallocation. And um, we do so by implementing a dynamic optimization program uh, that is built on uh, a paper written by Asker et al. And this optimization program consists in uh, three steps. Um, so first, we take all installations installed in, uh, in France, the French solar park, um, and we take that as given, okay? So we don't assume that there are potential um, other locations that could be um, used for solar facilities. Taking this uh, universe of solar installations, we optimize um, the trajectory of commissioning dates, so we optimize the sequence of installation dates in order to uh, reach um, the observed energy output that we have in the realized, in the uh, experienced um, trajectories that we had in France. And we do so by minimizing the present value of investments. So we just optimize on the sequence of um, installation dates to minimize total costs, okay? And what we find by doing so, we find that like, we can retrieve the same amount of energy produced by saving 30% of the total cost in present value, uh, which is this estimate of misallocation is quite larger than other studies, as I said, that focus on static misallocation uh, that reallocate plants geographically. So for instance, LEMP, uh, that studies the case of Germany, find that um, relocating solar plants across the, ter the territory increases the, solar the social value by 5%, okay? Um, 
Okay, and we try to dig it a bit further and find some drivers of this mislocation. And it seems that most of the mislocation is driven by implementing smallest installations, so residential uh, PV, too early uh, in the period. And that happened before 2011, where the feed-in tariffs in France were at, this, uh, at its highest level. Okay? And we see that after introdu intro, sorry, introducing auctions, uh, we have significant uh, improvement of this um, misallocation uh, value. Okay, so this is the remaining of my presentation. Um, okay, we use, um, so for our data, we use, we observe where and when solar units are commissioned uh, in France. Um, for the period between 25 and 2021, 25 corresponds to the beginning of uh, the PV uh, deployment. And what we do with this data is that we define categories of installations, project types, according to whether the project is residential or um, large-scale rooftop, for instance, on industrial sites, or ground-mounted utility-scale PV, okay? And on top of that, we define size bundles, okay, from the lowest to the highest project. And the idea is that for each subcategory, we retrieve investment costs and its evolution over time, okay? So we do so by calibrating, extrapolating data based on different reports. Um, and we use this investment cost to retrieve the levelized cost of electricity by summing up grid connection costs and retrieving also the total energy produced by these units. Okay, and using that data, we implement an optimization program that is quite um, straightforward. So we imagine that we have a social planner that chooses optimal sequence of uh, commissioning dates, okay, in order to um, minimize total costs and to reach a certain uh, energy output solar energy output every year, okay? So I only provide an intuition here of the algorithm. In the simplest case, where we have um, levelized cost of electricity that are constant over time, the solution of this program is as follows. You just have to, like you have a number of plants and a number of periods, and energy output to fulfill in each period. So you just have to rank projects from the cheapest to the, more, to, the, um, to the one with the highest LCOE, okay? And you just implement projects in increasing order until you reach your target, your output, okay? And for the year after, you just take remaining plans and you do it again, okay? So this is the simplest um, um, solution in the simplest case. In the, in the general case, we have a dynamic optimization, basically a trade-off between cheapest plant at time t and future prospects, future improvement of the investment costs uh, over time, okay? So implementing that, we obtain these, um, yeah, these are my baseline results. So these graphs show uh, on the left the realized trajectory, so what we have experienced in France in cumulative uh, capacity and yeah, broken down by categories, okay? And on the right, you have the optimized trajectory. Um, so what we obtain is that in the optimal trajectory, we can reduce the total cost in present value by almost 30%, okay? And what the optimization does, it reallocates early installations in residential PV to the, to the end of the period, okay? It postpones the installation dates of uh, smallest installations and replace that by large scale, larger um, facilities, okay? So this is robust to different discount rates and we have other uh, uh, <coughs> results, but yeah. I just want to show this uh, study. I try to go further and look at the drivers of this misallocation, 
And to do so, I implement different strategies. On the left, I do the same, but this time I freeze project categories, saying that the trajectory of one category is fixed, and I optimize on the rest. This is done because uh, we have different support mechanisms in France. They apply to different categories. So for instance, ground-mounted solar is more under auctions, while residential is more under fin-in tariffs. OK? So ah, OK. And the other, OK, I, I conclude. And the other strategy was to optimize by fixing years incrementally. Uh, to look at which year contributed the most to the misallocation. And so this is where we see that most happens at the beginning of the period and was driven by residential PV. Okay? So to conclude, um, this methodology found that uh, we could have saved more than 5 billion in present value to implement the same trajectory uh, in solar installations. But this must be taken with care. Um, First, we don't know how to attribute this cost and whether it's um, due to inevitable trial and error at the beginning of PV deployment. So the sector, uh, yeah, at the beginning of uh, the period. And also we have these unobserved objectives that might um, have to be considered, so, such as local jobs, uh, revenues for households, and uh, yeah, also this is a preliminary um, uh, result. Maybe it will change in the in the in the future. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like just to, before my presentation, this is a joint paper with my colleagues, so my co authors, Chao Yi Chen and Mimi Pinar, that also is coming here. Um, we are really pleased to be here for this presentation. Thank you to the scientific committee and also for the organizing committee for this great event. So, our paper, I would try to, because my site is not good enough. So um, I will just go oh, straight away. Okay, so energy efficiency is one, is an important issue in most of the government agendas nowadays because we are looking for reducing energy consumption in order to reduce carbon emissions from fossil fuels and electricity consumption. And also we try to contribute to the coupling of energy from economic growth. But we have another final result that we look for. We are not only looking at the uh, car reducing carbon emissions or environmental problems, we also are worried about wasting resources. So we want to be more efficient, of course, with uh, improving energy efficiency. If we look at, there are many papers talking about this uh, topic, but I would just focus on the uh, sun data of International Energy Agency, that they, they say that we are not achieving the, the expected uh, uh, improving in energy efficiency. So uh, it seems that we are doing uh, some efforts, but we have room for improvement. But on the other hand, we, we see here that uh, if non-energy efficiency improvement have occurred since 2000, it would have happened our carbon emissions would be 12 higher in 2017. So this means that energy efficiency is quite important for, uh, for our transition, right? So this is the reason why we are talking about this issue. And the literature let us classify the determinants of energy efficiency into three categories, technological, structural, and institutional. Among them, we can find here some that we are talking today, 
but for example, among technological, green technologies, or green innovation and technologies, foreign direct investment, GDP, population, structure of economy, energy prices. Among the uh, institutional, we have the institutional quality, and also taps and subsidies, that we have also talked about this today. Um, the literature sometimes is controversial about the, the effects that these factors how they influence on energy efficiency. For example, for in direct investment, some paper says that increase innovation in host countries, and of course, increase energy efficiency, but some others say, oh no, the, the investor are not worried about uh, environmental problems of the host countries. So uh, something happens also similar with energy prices. Some papers uh, say, of course, uh, oil prices, they are going to decrease energy intensity, but then some other says depend on the energy structure or depend on the geographical area that we are talking about. So, uh, of course, mm, this is some topic that we have going to uh, choose some determinants, and of course this is a limitation because we are just focusing on some of them. But, um, in fact, we are focusing on green innovation and technologies. The literature says that in reduce energy efficiency or energy intensity and improve energy efficiency. We have here some papers that uh, uh, have uh, um, studied this topic. And also, for example, the first one, uh, the results are really good for all sectors. So it seems that might help to reduce energy intensity. But um, if we combine this topic, ring innovation with institutional quality, we are uh, looking at the literature that they say, okay, institutional quality promotes innovation and renew renewable energies in some countries. Also, this green innovation reduces energy efficiency, so this is the link. Institutional uh, promotes innovation, innovation promotes green uh, technologies, um, then we promote energy efficiency. So our hypothesis, and this is what we want to test, is that there is a potential non-linear relationship between green technologies and uh, energy efficiency. And the threshold variable is going to be, for us, we, we are going to test if it's the institutional quality of government. Our period of analysis is 1996-2017. And we are going to look at 72 countries and our database is uh, variety uh, we have here from U.S. energy information, the electricity and the energy consumption, the World uh, Bank and also the British Petroleum for the energy prices. Here we have an overview of the 72 countries just to show that we have different uh, areas where the institutional quality is going to be quite different among them. So I think it's quite important just to, to have this overview, not only say that we, we study 70, 72 countries. Our variables are different. Uh, we try to cover this classification into uh, is a technological, structural and institutional. Um, in order to measure the energy efficiency, we are going to use energy intensity. E for green innovation and technologies, we are going to, be, to use the environmental patterns. Then for institutional quality, firstly, we are going to use the rule of law from the World Bank. Um, it's essentially to how the governments protect the property rights. But also we are going to use some other three variables in order, in order to control our results with the control of corruption, government effectiveness, and regulatory quality. Then we have some other control variables. They are uh, a variety of them, trade openness, population density, renewable energy consumption, GDP per capita, percentage of value added of industry on total output, CO2 emissions, electricity consumption, percentage in total energy consumption, oil prices, and gas prices. This is our model. Well, we start with this very simple. We right away. Energy intensity is our independent, uh, our dependent uh, variable, and we are going to test uh, to try to first estimate our linear model that is going to, to be tested with environmental patterns and other control variables. In order to introduce the threshold variable, we are going to estimate this regression model 
uh, dress hold model where uh, Q is the dress hold variable and gamma is going to be the true dress hold level. So if our countries uh, shows a dress hold variable with a, with a value above the true dress hold level, we are going to estimate the first equation. And if our countries have a threshold level with a value lower than the true threshold level, then we are going to estimate the second equation. So firstly, we try with the rule of law as a threshold dev level, but then we try with the other two that we mentioned before, uh, just before. So our just methodology process, just we are going to estimate our linear model uh, with uh, general, here I'll, I don't know if I have no point. Um, sorry. It's okay. Uh, we are going to estimate our linear model, but before we want to know if our variables should be used in levels or first differences, so we try with the unit root test. And before to use the unit root test, we have to decide if which kind of first generation or second generation of unit root test. So we try with the cross-sectional dependent test. And finally, once uh, we estimate the linear model, we go with the wall test in order to know if our hypothesis is correct or not. So let's go. Um, our cross-sectional dependent test let us reject the null hypothesis of cross-sectional independence. So we are going to use the unit root test in order to decide the, the one from Pesaran in order to decide which are going to be used in level sum in first differences. Once we use this test, we can see that the variables that are highlighted are going to be used in levels, right? For the others, we try also the, the unit root test, but uh, first differences, so we can reject uh, the, the null hypothesis, so we are going to use these variables in first differences. With this analysis, previous analysis, then, we go to the estimate of our model. So in green, we have those variables that reduce energy intensity. And then in orange, we have those that increase energy intensity, um, those that are significant. I think we can hear, here we can have a better uh, overview of the variables that affect energy intensity in our linear model. So higher levels of CO2 emissions, uh, GDP, um, uh, the increase in industrial value added is going to increase energy intensity, while the others, uh, population, higher levels of population density, renewable energy consumption, green innovation, and trade openings is going to reduce the other electricity consumption, energy prices, and institutional quality are not relevant in the model. So, but we insist on the idea that we think that the institutional quality is a threshold variable that can affect, sorry, can affect to the relationship between green innovation and energy intensity. In order to test this idea, we are gonna use the world test, and um, this let us uh, reject the null hypothesis of linear models, so we, we think that there is a non-linear relationship between the green innovation and energy efficiency, so, or energy intensity. So we try to use the institutional quality and concretely the rule of law in order to uh, decide this threshold um, model, right? In this, uh, the, we have here just the, the value just for you to know, but the relevant idea is that if the country has uh, uh, institutional quality, the rule of law lower than the value that we have here, they are going to uh, consider our low quality regimes. And those countries with a value higher than that, we are going to consider them high quality regimes. So here we have the estimates, and again in green, those that reduce energy intensity, and on, or in orange, those that increase. Here we can see better. So what happens that in those countries with a high quality regimes, those countries that has a value um, above the true dress level, threshold level, uh, we find that environmental patterns are, are 
here as a key factor that decreases energy intensity. However, this factor is, doesn't appear in those countries with a low quality regime. So, uh, of course, there are other variables as electricity consumption and population. All of them decrease energy intensity. But the idea is, the, our hypothesis is, okay, the environmental patterns, the promotion of environmental patterns are going to have an effect on energy intensity only in those countries where there are uh, important protection of property rights. In those other countries that are not, you have to reach at least a minimum level of uh, property rights in order to that the, the effectiveness of these environmental patterns uh, appear, right? So um, um, there are other variables uh, such as CO2 emissions and GDP that increase energy intensity, but in both uh, type of countries. Um, finally, the energy prices only affect only those high quali uh, low quality countries. We have also test uh, our conclusions. We can conclude our finding is that the environmental patterns lead to a reduction in energy intensity if and only if countries surpass a, cent a certain threshold of institutional quality. We have tried also this not only with rule of law, we have tried with the control of corruption and the other control variables and the results are similar. So this is our conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. First of all, I, want, I would like to thank the Chair of Energy Sustainability for the opportunity of being here presenting our work. I'm Cristina Pizarro Irizar. I'm Associate Professor at the University of the Basque Country and Associate Researcher at the Basque Center for Climate Change. Uh, here today, the paper I'm going to present is written together jointly with uh, Pello Alcorta and Maripaz Espinosa, which are colleagues from the University of the Basque Country. And actually, this paper is a part of uh, Peyo Alcorta's PhD thesis. But unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so I'm going to present it uh, instead. Finally, I would like to add that this is still a work in progress, so any comment, suggestion, or criticism will be truly welcome, uh, either at the end of the presentation or in the coffee break afterwards, that we will have more time. So in this paper, what we do is uh, we work with renewable energy incentives. Um, I actually mentioned renewable energy, but uh, we focus on uh, renewable energy for electricity production. Um, we are working with this uh, because of all the objectives to install new renewable capacity uh, that are in line with the 2030-2050 agenda at the world level, and particularly at the, in the European Union. And these incentive schemes could be awarded e either by competitive means, such as renewable energy auctions, or established administratively, such as the uh, feed-in tariff schemes, uh, among many others. But in any case, uh, they could be categorized depending on the type of uh, payment that they receive. And we categorize them in three different uh, structures. Uh, two of them are related to the fixed payment that investors, generators, received for producing their electricity, and another more flexible schemes. So among the fixed payment uh, incentives, we highlight the fixed price uh, scheme and the fixed revenue scheme. The fixed price scheme could be more or less equivalent to a feed-in tariff scheme, where generators received a fixed payment per megawatt hour of electricity actually produced and generated. Uh, so they face the risk of not producing enough electricity to receive the, the, uh, the payment. 
Uh, on the contrary, under the fixed revenue schemes, which could be equivalent to this um, regulation that was enacted in Spain after, after the abolishment of the feeding tariff schemes and was based on a reasonable uh, return on the investment, we call this regulation the rate of return investment. And in this case, we, um, the risk of not producing enough electricity is uh, is diminished because investors get a fixed payment uh, for all the uh, in, in a, um, independently of the energy that they uh, provide to the grid, but they face the risk of uh, producing too many too much energy. And among more flexible schemes, we highlight what we call the share upside scheme. And in this case, um, generators received on top of a fixed payment that could be equivalent to the fixed uh, price structure, uh, more flexibility because they are also subject to market structures and they could uh, receive uh, complementary payments uh, depending on market prices. So, um, renewable um, uh, projects uh, face risk, as we mentioned before, and these risks are related to two principal sources. First, the uncertainty on market prices, which are unknown in advance, and second, the uncertainty on the electricity that is going to be delivered to the network because of the intermittency nature of uh, the main renewable sources, such as wind and solar power. So, uh, in this case, public incentives try to diminish this risk that incept, um, investors or generators uh, are subject to. So, um, but um, these regulatory policies, um, in an attempt to reduce this risk, offer a right to the investors of uh, reducing this risk. But also, they impose an obligation if uh, generators are subject uh, to these incentive schemes. And what we argue in this paper, this is our main hypothesis, is that the, uh, we are working to, with this trade-off between the risk, uh, the right, and the obligation. We argue that um, at uh, in initial stages, for instance, in Spain uh, from 10 years ago, uh, the right of these incentive schemes uh, was higher than the obligation that, that these schemes may be imposing nowadays in a different context where renewable energy is um, uh, more mature and where uh, the market environment imposes higher prices. And actually, this is related with what, what Mar was uh, commenting on before in, in her plenary speech. And uh, renewable energy today, uh, at least in Spain, uh, doesn't need so high levels of subsidies or investments in this case. So our contribution is twofold. On the one hand, we have a theoretical contribution. We develop a very simple model that can be easily calibrated only with a few parameters and that we can play with it to simulate the risk exposure of different incentive schemes. And we also um, develop what we call the incentive um, proposition equivalence, the, the incentive equivalence propositions in which we can compare the risk exposure of different incentive schemes. For instance, if we know the parameters and the risk exposure of one scheme, we could design other schemes facing the same risk exposure with different parameters, and both of them could be equivalent. And we also have an empirical contribution since we applied our theoretical model uh, to the Spanish case for two different periods and for uh, different regulatory sources, uh, for different uh, renewable sources. Actually, the paper could be implemented for any renewable source, uh, any period. We are going to focus on an annual basis, but for any period, and also for any country. So I will start describing the foundations of the model. So if we assume a system where there are no uh, renewable incentives, the uh, revenue that uh, generators will receive will just be the market revenue, multiplying the amount of electricity that they sell by the electricity price. But if we have uh, incentive schemes, we also have a regulatory revenue. And we are going to compare the relationship between this regulatory revenue and this market revenue. And this is the way we are going to value this V, the, um, the regulatory policy. And in order to value it, we are going to analyze the right to sell the electricity that generators have, or either at a minimum price or a guaranteed price, and the um, obligation to sell it, again, at a maximum price or a regulated tariff. 
and the value of the regulatory policy will just be the difference between this uh, right and this obligation. So we actually are borrowing an approach that comes from real option pricing, and this could be more or less equivalent to the put call parity, where the right to sell will be equivalent to a put option and the obligation to sell to a call option. So, let's see two examples to understand how we value renewable energy policies. Let's assume in this case that the support mechanism offers at time t equals zero uh, to be paid uh, at time t uh, the right to sell the electricity. So, what happens if in this case the regulatory revenue uh, is higher than the market revenue, then investors receive a payoff, which is just the difference, but zero on the contrary. So what we do is to we uh, compute the right of uh, this um, regulatory policy considering the expected value of this difference between the regulatory uh, incentive and the market price, or zero in, in, the, in the other case. And we use the, uh, the R, the lowercase r, is the, a constant discount rate. Following the same structure, we could also model the obligation that the generator faces. So in this case, if market price, market revenue is higher than this uh, regulatory uh, incentive, then uh, investors pay up to the difference, and otherwise they uh, give up to nothing. So again, we can uh, model this obligation considering this very same structure when the expected value. Once we have defined how we value the um, uh, incentive schemes, we are going to present the other um, variables that uh, lie in our model. Actually, the variables that are related with uncertainty, these two sources of uncertainty that we mentioned before, on prices and on quantities. And we consider them as geometric Brownian uh, pro motion processes uh, with the drift, the mu parameter is the drift of the processes, and the volatility with the sigma parameter. And the term uh, W is the uh, Wiener process of the geometric and Brownian process. And we assume that these processes are correlated, since electricity prices and renewable amounts uh, is proven that they are uh, correlated. Actually, when there are more renewables in the market, electricity prices tend to fall. So we are going to uh, model the three price structures that we defined before using this approach. So the fixed price regulation, the fixed revenue regulation, and the share upside regulation. And we follow the same structure for the three of them. The model is not very complex, but I have um, simplified it very much here. So if you have any questions later on, we can talk on it. So we present the right, the obligation, and the value of the policy as a difference between the two options. So in the case of a fixed um, price regulation, since investors get an um, incentive depending on each megawatt hour produced, we have to multiply the total amount of electricity that they produce in a certain period, uppercase T, uh, multiplied by the difference between the regulated price, this K, minus the market price, S. And for the obligation, we just computed uh, as, as, as we mentioned in the previous slides. In the, case, wait, sure, sorry. in the case of a fixed revenue regulation, the concept is slightly different because in this case, uh, generators are offered a fixed payment for uh, all the electricity they sell, independently of the electricity they sell. So the fixed payment will be compared to the market revenue price multiplied by quantity. In the case of the right, in the case of the obligation, and the value of the policy will be just the difference. And finally, for the share upside regulation, the part of the right of this policy is equivalent to the fixed price regulation, but here we have a new parameter, alpha, that represents the, um, the relationship um, between this um, extra payment that a generator could get from the payment. And what we actually multiply in the uh, obligation equation is the term one minus alpha, which represents the share of the upside retained by the regulator. Finally, we propose the incentive equivalence proposition, and in this case, we analyze the value of the regulatory policy and also the right and the obligation because we assume that all regulatory policies uh, face a different risk exposure, so maybe we would be interested in comparing different structures with different parameters and seeing the equivalence. 
In the critical part of this paper, we are still working on this. I will present only two slides. And we implemented our theoretical model for two technologies, wind energy and solar PV in Spain, and for two different periods. In the left panel, we can see the year 2013, and in the right panel, the year 2021. Those years, as I mentioned before, uh, present different structures in terms of incentive and in terms of market prices too. So what we observe in red is the value of the obligation that the uh, renewable uh, technology imposes, in green the value of the right, and in blue the difference, the value of the regulatory policy. And we compare three different um, regulatory incentive schemes. The feed-in tariff scheme that was enforced in the year 2013 and is equivalent to what we call the fixed price scheme. Then the rate of return regulation that started after the abolishment of the feeding tariff scheme and is enforced today for a previously installed technologies, what we named the rate of return regulation, ROR. And finally, the last system which is based on capacity auction that is actually in place. What we observe is that, and the results are similar for wind and, and the magnitude uh, changes, but are similar in essence for wind and solar, is that under the, uh, in 2013, when prices, market prices were lower, uh, the obligation imposed by these incentive schemes was neg negligible, was very small, and the value of the policy is positive, higher for feeding tariff schemes and a bit lower for rate of return regulation because of the right, uh, of the value of the right of the policy. But on the contrary, in the context of high prices, at the one we are seeing in 2021, the obligation uh, imposed by the regulatory scheme becomes higher and the value of the policy is therefore negative. In the case of solar, we observe uh, qualitatively same results, but um, the... The mind, yes, I'm about to finish, thank you. The magnitude of the change uh, is much higher if we focus on the vertical axis. I didn't mention before, but here we are comparing the value of one megawatt of renewable energy installed, so that each renewable incentive, the, um, in spite of their different nature, are comparable. And in this case, the only technology that we observe a negative value is, well, the only system is the, um, the system based on an, a share of site regulation, uh, which offers a negative value for the year 2021. So, all in all, in this paper, we propose a theoretical model, simple, in order to value the risk that investors face when dealing with new renewable energy investments. And uh, we propose also the incentive equivalent proposition that we are, uh, are working right now in the empirical part of, of this uh, part of the paper. And empirically, what we proved is that in Spain 10 years ago, the incentive schemes were um, profitable in the terms of um, the value that they uh, gave to uh, investors and to generators. But in the new context of high prices and mature renewable policies, they are becoming a liability and they are not so profitable anymore. So thank you for your attention. Perfect. Well, thank you all of you, and sorry for being so picky, but time is time. Now, questions from the audience. We are going to make all the questions together, and then they will answer. So, here, that was the first one. Introduce oh, yourself, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, uh, I, I'm Yang Zheng, I'm from London School of Economics. Uh, I have a question for the, uh, about the green innovation and energy efficiency. Uh, because when we talk about uh, how green tech, when we talk about green technology, you should keep and divide in two parts. One is innovation, there's a new uh, technology happening. And second is adoption. But in the, because in many of the developing economics, uh, they don't really innovate a lot but they receive like a technology from other economics and to improve their energy efficiency uh, via some channel, for example, the FDI you have mentioned in your, in your presentation. So I'm thinking, is it possible, or would it be possible, or like do you observe like any kind of uh, is adopt, adoption or spillovers uh, that uh, can uh, improve the energy efficiency? Thank you. Yes, so I have a few questions for the audience, uh, the presenters. So to Julien, I wondered if the results would hold in the context of sustainability bonds, since uh, these ones are increasing compared to green bonds. Uh, for 
Uh, I, I wrote the questions because honestly I, I forgot them in the middle, but uh, so Nicola, I wanted to know if you think thought that credit constraints or perceived risks explain why we would have uh, implemented smaller projects first instead of larger projects. Uh, Rossi, I wanted to know if you thought that maybe fossil fuel subsidies could uh, be linked to low institutional quality and have an impact on your, on your results. And, and finally, uh, Christina, I, I wanted to know if uh, you could explain a bit more the difference in outcomes for wind and uh, solar uh, installations in, in your results. Thanks. Um, I'm Sugandha from the University of Oxford. Um, so I had a question on the green bonds paper. So if there are no carbon penalties, does the effect disappear? And if that is the case, is this just another channel through which carbon pricing is having an impact? The other question on green bonds is, can you link this to actual outcome variables on reducing emissions? So for example, are the green bonds are the green bonds <laughs> actually linked to reducing emissions? And do you measure that? Because I know there's been a lot of criticism on greenwashing and whether these bonds actually do anything. Um, Nicholas, on your paper, I wanted to know, um, was there a political economy behind supporting small installations a lot? The reason I ask is because the UK did the same thing, and it was because politicians just you know, they got a lot of votes by <laughs> supporting smaller installations, um, and it was really about that in the UK. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, uh, pro probably I can have one more question <coughs> here. Yes, that's for the first paper. Uh, because when you talk about the uh, the green bond, actually they send a signal to the uh, to the to the stock returns. So I'm thinking, does it mean that the manager usually they care about the short term uh, interest uh, rather than the long term? And does it really uh, does it really reflect it in the like the, the the term of the green bond? Like they just have the short term green bond to send a signal rather than they they don't prefer the long term one. Thanks. I have also two questions uh, for Julian and for uh, Rocio. Uh, for Julian, uh, do you think? I mean, can you? Do you think that your hypothesis could be also good for? I mean, we know that um, one of the main issuers of uh, green bonds, by one part, are the corpor corporations. By the other hand, that is, I mean, has a, a share of 22, 23 percent. But the other, other 22, 23 percent are financial institutions. So. How can you apply this kind of hypothesis to uh, for financial? I mean, maybe they they can use it as a signal that they are uh, uh, committed to to reduce the risks. I mean, the the risks that they 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 carry for climate change and transition risks. I don't know, but just a question. And Rocío, the the the, the institutional uh, quality variable, the ROL, rule of law. Is the threshold value is 0.807, and which is the maximum one? I mean, which is the range? I, I didn't. Maybe I I missed that part. Mm, thank you. We can. I mean, you, we can answer in the same way that, that the, the presentation is that way. Yeah, you start. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So uh, s thank you. So let me uh, take questions in the order in which I, <laughs> I know. So uh, uh, one was about the, 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 the short termism of managers. So that's 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 a great point. Like you know, what we use to measure the interest of managers in the, in stock prices is this WPS. That is how their wealth um, changes. Uh, with the, the stock price of their firm. And as a matter of fact, uh, the, the components of the manager's compensation that, that moves with the stock price typically are a short-term 
components. That, you know, stock options with limited vested periods, for example. So, uh, you know, I, it's a, like a, a dangerous direction because that means that maybe in that particular context, uh, in that particular context, maybe short termism of managers induced by the structure of the compensation, maybe has, you know, two uh, opposite effects. On the one hand, typically short-termism is sort of bad for environmental investment, but in that particular case, it seems to uh, induce managers to do more commitments because they... Trigger. So that's a great point. You, know, you see what I mean? Like, it's kind of dangerous to conclude that short-termism short would be good. Uh, to, in fact, I think one of the, of, the, of the suggestions of our resort is that managers' incentives matter. And, and, I, and I, 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 I guess, I speculate. Let me speculate that there's going to be a lot of economics and finance research about the role of managers' incentives. Now corporations increasingly uh, pay CEO, CEO according to uh, environmental performance. And, and you know, I think we, 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 we're going to need research to know what is the margin uh, of the policy intervention in that uh, domain. Sorry, I, uh, I'm going to try to be uh, briefer than that. Or you like me to, to continue later? Or? No? Okay. So uh, I don't have much to say about the sustainability uh, link bonds, but my colleagues in Geneva did research about that, and I feel ashamed. I, I'm not feeling comfortable sharing their results with you. But you know, uh, Tony Berada and uh, Philippe Kruger and the, the Department of Finance at the University of Geneva, uh, I think, did a, a great job about that. But uh, so I'm, I'll send you the paper. And, <laughs> and, um, yes, clearly what we find empirically, and this is consistent with the theory, is that green bonds may amplify already existing decarboniz decarbonization incentives like carbon penalties. We find that the total effects of managers' incentives, so, so that, that, that could lead them to additional uh, green investments, uh, disappear when carbon penalty, where because it's, a, it's a more like a country variation, uh, disappear where carbon penalties are too low. And when carbon penalties become higher, we, so things suggest like this amplification mechanism, that is that you take into account decarbonization incentives directly, like you take into account the carbon penalty as a manager's maximizing profit, but you also take into account you double, you, 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 can't eat, uh, in, uh, you, you, uh, you take it into account a second time when you care about stock returns because stock returns reflect the fact that green projects are advantaged by, okay? So, so that's, that's, that's very much what, what, we, uh, what we find. Uh, go government bonds is very, are very interesting. First of all, because in some cases, they are anti-constitutional. No, earmark, it is earmarking. Many governments cannot earmark. No. So, you know, but when you can uh, earmark, you can do a credible green bond, it can be certified. Okay? Uh, what would you like to signal then? Maybe your, your commitment to the environment, to uh, voters, it's a possibility. Maybe it's, why, it's one way to actually uh, you know, circumvent the fact that you cannot earmark in general. I, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, no, but that's, that's for sovereigns, but I was asking for financial institutions. By financial institutions, it's, uh, it's hard to interpret. Okay, banks like, for example, or, or international, uh, or like the World Bank, for example, could issue a green bond. Case bank. They finance case. projects, but they finance typically a bunch of projects or uh, green subsidies. Uh, it's, 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 it's more difficult. The case of corporate green bonds is, is, is a bit clearer because you can see... Um, uh, you can see stock prices that reflect what markets believe about the profitability of projects. It, it, it's more difficult to study, if you like, to, to, to look into uh, uh, financial green bonds. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I agree with you. I think there can be a lot of political objectives behind uh, focusing on small distributed uh, units. However, um, I did not find evidence of like politics formalizing these objectives back in the 2010s. Like I tried to look at uh, you know law reports to see if, for instance, local jobs or uh, land use or yeah different objectives like that were written in these reports. I don't know if it was the case in the UK, for instance. Okay, and also I don't. 
I didn't find yet uh, studies on the socio-economic impacts of uh, small distributed units, uh, especially in France. And uh, yeah, I think this is a, there may be a, a little hole in, uh, in the economic literature, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point. And I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. Um, can you? Yeah, uh, so basically, if you know, if these projects are new, uh, you may not want to start with a big installation because you may not find access to finances easily or <coughs> very high. So you will start with the small ones and this kind of like move over to bigger installations later on. Yeah, I agree. This is why um, I put a, cav a caveat being what can be attributed to uh, trial and error, like the cost of beginning, the deployment of PV, uh, where, where you start from scratch, and actually, you're, you're right, like discussing with PV developers, um, I understood that they first learned on smallest installations in order to then be able to build large-scale uh, projects. So, yeah, this is a, a relevant uh, comment. Yes, thank you also for your question, Soledad. Uh, the range of the, the institutional quality is plus 2.5, minus 2.5. So this is the, the value that we get. And then for the, your question, <laughs> I, I, it's a long time ago. Uh, you asked me, Cohen, about the uh, subsidies? So, uh, so the institutional quality would drive on uh, fossil fuel subsidies, so it would not naturally tend to drive also on energy efficiency and policies, because if you have cheap energy in the first place, that's driven by bad institutions, then you will have an impact on the world of fossil fuels as, as another explanation. Okay, yes, just to take into account for explanation, so thank you. Yes, I think uh, we have to look to better to the these control variables that we, we use, not only the rule of law and everything, and, and we will have to take into account this, uh, the, the effect of the subsidies and how they are taking into account in these variables. And I think there was another one, but can you please re remember? Can you, I, because oh, I can't yeah. hear. Uh, sorry, it's about like, innovation and adoption, because like, can you, is it possible, can you, uh, do you observe like so adoption of green technology in some economics, especially in those developing economics, because they don't really innovate a lot in green fields, but they receive the technology from other countries. But yeah. what do you mean, in the, in the final results, that maybe they are affected by, by yes. this kind of so, countries? So, Yes, sir. The high, the low quality countries are those that, that they are not. Promoting. No, it's kind of the energy efficiency in some of the country. They might be driven by like adoption, not probably like uh, some incre some innovation with some incremental improvement, but not by some like very uh, big uh, technology breakthrough. So I think that's kind of difference in the in the uh, in driven force by yeah by different kind of the you know, green innovation. But maybe it depends on the variable that we have chosen, the environmental patterns that maybe is influencing in this kind of result. This might happen that the, the I don't know, if we measure the um, in green innovation through environmental patterns, might happen that not all countries uh, provoke this uh, promotion. That's what I, I think. Um, but if we best, uh, the result, or at least the literature, let us know that it's going to reduce energy intensity. But the thing is that if we have a high quality regimes in our countries, these effects are going to be, to, to be more effective. But, you know, it always depends on the variable that we, we choose, maybe. Of course. I don't know. Thank, Thank you.
Yes, and just to finish, um, I was asked to extend a little more uh, what happens with solar energy in the empirical part of the paper. Actually, the results in, in terms of sign are equivalent, are similar between wind and, and solar, but uh, particularly in the case of the feed-in type scheme, the fixed scheme, what happened in Spain in the year 2013 and, and in the previous years is that the incentives that were administratively established for solar power were higher an order of magnitude higher than the incentives that were established for other technologies. So in a context of lower market prices and very, very high incentives, uh, unitary incentives per megawatt hour, uh, the uh, right that uh, regulatory policies entailed was much higher than compared to any other renewable technology because of this difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Julien told me that he didn't answer a question, so he I will, forgot to answer your question. He will just Sorry for that. Very short. Very short. So you asked about the, uh, what do we know about the environmental effect of uh, green bonds? Of course, so this is not really my, my research, but of course it's a very important point. The most important paper in that, uh, in that domain is due to Caroline Flammer, and it shows that when you match firms that issued green bonds with firms that are similar, but that issued another uh, bond, find that the, the former decrease their CO2 emissions in the next two years, like pretty largely. She find a very strong effect, 15, 20 percent. Something that cannot really be explained by green bonds, by the way, because green bonds on average are about, you know, 4 percent of the corporate debt. See, so, plus, plus uh, it doesn't tell us about the direction of causality. So, but at least this is a paper that is invoked to rule out the possibility of greenwashing. There is at least a form of consistency, only for certified green bonds, by the way. For non-certified green bonds, it doesn't work. But when green bonds are, are certified, at least there is a consistency. Eh? We do something in the paper that is to exploit recent uh, policy support to green bonds in some Asian countries, and so to use it as an instrument. This goes in the direction suggested by, by Flammer. But you know, we exploit country-level uh, variations in CO2 emissions, it's like a long shot. So that's all we know. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. The session is finished. Coffee. There is a coffee break now until uh, 10 minutes to 12. Compared to the coffee, it's a short time.